Today, we discuss that High School of the Dead meets Train to Busan when an anti-bullying organization decides to resort to biological warfare. Taking the saying, we have nothing to fear except fear itself to a viral level. You are what you eat. A series with characters making so many bad decisions, I wonder if they are related to my ex. When your body is endorsed by Rice Krispies. Snap, crackle, pop, Rice Krispies. Blood armor is a genetic factor. This all started because cats are dicks, and I love cats. A show that forgets concepts about its virus more often than I forget to drink water throughout the day. The don't come to school tomorrow virus. When you're not dead, but not alive, but are completely hangry. And the smells like teen spirit show itself. Today, we are telling you why you wouldn't survive All of Us Are Dead's Jonas Virus Zombie Apocalypse. Originating from the mind of Dr. Lee Byung Chun, a brilliant academic that acquired a PhD in cell biology, worked as a researcher for a U.S. pharmaceutical company before quitting to become a high school science teacher. Sounds a bit familiar, huh? <laughs> After his son was driven to the point of attempted self-inflicted not alive by high school bullies, Dr. Lee became stricken with anger and resentment, both at the situation and the school's complete refusal to address the problem for fear of making the school look bad. Dr. Lee knew that the system that was supposed to protect his son was failed and wanted his son to fight back at any cost, although his timid son would refuse to do so. Taking matters into his own hands, Dr. Lee wanted to find a way to help his son with the only way he know how to do. Science! The high school science teacher ran tests on entrapped mice and cats, looking for any rodent that wouldn't keel over and accept their fate. One day, he discovered a mouse that was not crippled by fear and that lost all sense and recklessly attacked the cat that was bullying it. His M.O. was to alter man to not be crippled by fear by unleashing basic inner instincts that society deemed so unlike modern man to muster and unleash rage to give the fearful few a fighting chance. To basically evolve humanity so that the powerless can fight back against the powerful, which is a strong theme within the series' narrative. Due to this particular mouse's heightened testosterone levels, Dr. Lee extracted a certain hormone within it and refined it into a serum, hoping to basically convert the fear response, the fight or flight response, within the amygdala so that his son and humanity in general would eventually never fear again, and tackled their fears head on with blind determination, but more so than anything, rage. However, it's because of this focus on fear within the brain that an infected host will fight like hell to survive because of the fear they display and how they feel that he would use this on his own son and find terrifying results. He soon referred to this as the Jonas virus, named after Hans Jonas, a German-American philosopher that emphasized the responsibilities of modern science in relation to life. A principle of his beliefs was the heuristic of fear, with heuristic basically meaning a mental shortcut to allow a person to reach a conclusion quickly, with heuristic of fear defining fear as a guide to responsibility that drives virtues of all man, and that fear is a determining factor that drives man, especially as it has evolved alongside technology and become crippled by it. Heuristics are natural amongst many animals as life needs to make quick decisions in order to operate and, more importantly, survive. Dr. Lee found inspiration in Hans Jonas's idea of the heuristic of fear and drew parallels of finding shortcuts to extinguish and utilize fear in a way that would evolve mankind. Later on, military scientists described the virus as one with no known origin, with homology tests all coming up inconclusive. There was no virus like it before. There was no connection to rabies or anything. This was completely new. All RNA results come up different with each testing cycle, showing the virus mutates rapidly. So rapidly, in fact, that creating a vaccine or countermeasure for it is nigh impossible. Even its creator said the only cure for it is just to out right kill the host that is harboring it and then burn the body to prevent its spread in any way. Fire was the cure. Dr. Lee basically just took this ideology of the heuristic of fear into an extremist way, 
creating a viral disease that relied on fear swiftly becoming hostile anger. These results would create something reminiscent of Zombies to 28 Days Later and Train to Busan, with an evolution beyond them known as Hambies we'll discuss later. But any suggestion at quelling this outbreak and further info would die, along with Dr. Lee, as he eventually sacrifices himself, regretting what he had unleashed upon the world. In this scenario, though, there's not going to be some cure that comes out of nowhere. We will assume the worst and say this gets worldwide quickly with no known point of origin. It is everywhere. So, what is this virus? What is it going to be doing in the long run? Well, Dr. Lee described the cellular process after introduction into the body as every cell struggling to survive within you, and the body's strongest cells are going to be attacking the weakest cells, leading to a litany of horrific symptoms and transformations, most notably causing the heart to completely stop, the flesh to fluctuate in a rotting process, but the brainstem to remain active, much like the walking dead virus. Kind of like rabies, it is seemingly spreadable through exclusively mammals like rodents and humans. With the vector going through bodily fluids, meaning any bite from an infected person or drop of blood or saliva, basically any bodily fluid that gets into an orifice of yours, can mean quick and definite transmission, even with blood that has laid on a surface like a rag for a while that touches an open wound. The turn rate is up to or around 24 hours if either bitten by a small enough mammal while also being given medication to slow the symptoms like benzodiazepine, but in most cases, like 99.95% of cases, the turn rate can and will be between 30 seconds to 5 minutes. Not long after exposure to the Jonas virus through saliva or blood will symptoms most of the time almost immediately start to arise as they turn. A small but noticeable nosebleed along with dizziness, fatigue, vision becoming red and blurry, and muffled hearing will occur. Their odor is often also described as that of a rotting corpse. In some cases, afflicted individuals will start to say how much they want to kill anyone out of their overridden fear now being completely replaced with the aforementioned anger. The veins will darken sporadically throughout the body and often cause profuse bleeding from the eyes, nose, and mouth, and in some cases, as the gums begin to puff up with flesh bubbling up in some areas and the teeth to become more able to bite others. While this occurs, bodily temperature will drastically decrease as low as 29.1 degrees Celsius, or if you're an American, 84.3 degrees Fahrenheit. The victim's body will seize up as muscles completely stiffen as the sound of snapping of bones and cartilage can be heard with each sudden and stilted movement, as if afflicted by rigor mortis, much like... Train to Busan. The movie? Oh my god, man. He's watching his dub, it's the bro. Same thing. Usually, very soon after these breakdowns, will they fully convert into a mindless zombie. Much like those of the rage virus, do victims display heightened levels of aggression, anger, and temperament. Joints will instantly seize up. The body can and sometimes contort to the level of exorcist levels of distortion. From this point on, their body, save for their brain, is effectively dead and for some reason still functioning in a very disjointed and labored manner, but is still able to exist as long as the brain is functioning. For some infected individuals, through either minuscule transmission vectors or through sheer willpower, are they able to hold out just a little bit longer before fully succumbing and transforming, but only after do their latent fears and insecurities magnify in their mind as they start to perceive everyone else as deadly threats to their own survival, as seen with Gyan Su, who, after long being harassed and bullied for his impoverished nature, saw everyone in his final conscious moments as zombies out to laugh at and kill him. He was obligated to fight back against these evil people. This may explain why people in a massive outbreak in a populated area will tend to turn so quickly. Since the Jonas virus enters the gray matter looking to prey upon one's fears, infecting people already in a panic would mean a swift and easy turn rate most of the time. From then on, whether they turn in seconds or in minutes, will they become mindless killing machines with one goal, infection. 
These zombies will attack recklessly in a veritable straight line to the point where they will run off buildings and straight into walls marking no sense of self-preservation as they are overwhelmed with feral rage and hunger. Even to the point where they will full force tackle prey through windows, although most if not all, will survive falls from great heights to continue hunting. This primal mental state will cause them to lose most of their motor skills, preventing them from opening doors, using tools and weapons and more. With the majority of zombies being unable to scale vertical surfaces, climb up objects, and having to resort to getting down on all fours just to ascend a flight of stairs. Although sometimes they can maneuver themselves to jump slash climb obstacles or other zombies to reach their target, but it seems to be in a minuscule portion of the zombie majority. They do retain strength equal to or slightly more than their healthier counterpart and will use it to their full advantage, busting down doors and defenses with ease. But this reckless strategy comes at a cost of their intellect. They can also be easily distracted from just about any endeavor due to a heightened sense of hearing and smell, as any sound or shift in their sight like a screaming person far away or being thrown off someone can have them switching their focus on the drop of a dime. Loud sounds from sources like helicopters or PA systems can have them all swarming to their visual and audio sources, most notably those reaching 24 hertz, meaning sudden sounds can have them all flock away and into particular locations. Familiar sounds and sights like an old friend whistling can take their full prerogative as they can retain some of those suppressed memories from their former life. Much like a generic zombie, if they see a fellow zombie running after something else, they will blindly follow them in their pursuit, thinking the next meal is along the way. The bottom line is that they will often gather in hordes to congregate on anything that makes them think they can further their infection. Without something to target or actively hunt, they will meander around and wander aimlessly much like any other zombie would. These zombies do have a voracious appetite and will actively hunt people to consume their flesh, unlike 28 Days Later in Train to Busan Zombies, being able to rip you open and tear out your insides just with their teeth and fingers. But this is because the virus looking to alter the mind to make it think like they want to eat, but it's mainly just to spread the infection. Dr. Lee even drew a parallel to Lusochloridium paradoxum, a parasitic virus that forces snails to ascend to the highest and most open points in order to be consumed and infect birds. Basically meaning the zombie is going to go out of its way to infect in any way possible, not keeping in mind its own safety. The zombie itself only has the goal of ensuring more infections will occur by its brutal fangs no matter how senseless the cost, much like the rodent fighting the cat. Lending back to the Jonas virus, having no self-preservation for the host body it is infecting. They are remarkably resilient. They can be stabbed all over, they have can take hellacious amounts of blunt force trauma without faltering, and basically, like many other reanimated soldiers of the genre, must pretty much have either their head removed or their brains destroyed. Although an extremely sharp and deep blow to the neck seems to be an effective way to take them out, the consistencies when it comes to killing a zombie aren't really in the series, but this is what I could gather. They can have whole body parts amputated and even survive long falls to the ground that would pretty much splatter anyone and just get it back up after a little bit. And they can even forcefully snap their spines in two, which, I mean, if they're crippled in any way, it will slow their movement, but they will still be persistent in taking down anything they can lay their eyes on. However, another factor into the deadliness of this outbreak and what can be a huge determinant in your non-survival is the fact that some people can have the virus mutate within them, turning them into hambies. Neither zombie nor human. A half zombie. It's half zombie. Which honestly sounds like something regular show would come up with Mordecai and Rigby going, well, they're not zombies, but they're half a zombie. They're hambies. Yeah, yeah. But this is what Dr. Lee referred to as a human evolution due to the Jonas virus. Dr. Lee said if the virus and its aggressive behavior detects antibodies within the body, it will transform and mutate so that the antibodies will not attack the virus, allowing it to, in a way, learn the human mind. It would also seem this mutation occurs within people that have undergone tenuous amounts of stress and more so anger before their death. The suicidal girl 
had felt abandoned by her love, and that she was about to be labeled a whore by social media, and that she angrily could trust no one before dying to a horde. The bully was beyond livid at Chong Song for not being submissive, denying him of his dominance, and injuring him to the point that he lost a fight, pleading that he would kill Chong before being eaten alive. And the original kid that was bullied was just bullied to the point that he just couldn't take anymore. So it's just extreme emotion that may be a factor into all of this since it does affect the brain and the amygdala. So mental health could be a factor with the Jonas virus. But whether antibodies or extreme anger or emotions factor into this, mutations among the masses will occur in small pockets. These hambies will not instantly become stark raving mad upon infection and dying, even if bitten all over the body. In fact, upon turning, they will show slight shock at themselves being basically brought back from the dead and ignored by other zombies. But this surprise usually fades as the reasons for their anger before death will culminate in their mind as all they can focus on is their point of animosity while suddenly craving flesh and having a desire to eat the living to the point where they feel like they are starving to death. They will try and satiate their hunger with other types of flesh, like zombies or fish, but for the most part, only warm flesh can suffice. Eating human flesh allows them to retain their humanity for as long as they are full, and like I said, they can eat zombie flesh to curb their hunger, but doing so would cause them to act completely like their zombie counterparts and become mindless, flesh-craving monsters, bringing a whole new meaning to, you are what you eat. From then on, they will possess the ability to maneuver around hordes of undead, basically unnoticed even if they act like a normal, healthy human, leading to the conclusion that infected feral humans can detect the virus in other creatures and avoid attacking them simply by odor as zombies are attracted to the scent of worn flesh, since zombies and hambies are said to smell like rotting corpses. Other symptoms of an infected will also remain like rigor mortis stricken joints snapping, but more than anything they will fly into blind stints of rage wanting nothing more than to kill non-infected people if they deem them a threat or a delicacy and can spread the Jonas virus via their own blood and bites. They are also extremely resilient, bolstering expedited and remarkably fast regenerative capabilities to heal themselves quickly. With their bodies being torn apart by zombie hordes prior to infection, falling great heights, or being hit by full speed buses that would splatter any regular person as their anatomy mends their broken bones, torn tissues, and ruptured blood vessels to eventually reanimate the body enough to function while exterior wounds and scars are mostly untouched. They will also develop greater strength, enough to easily pick up grown adults with one arm, snapping human arms in half, and punching and kicking others a few feet in the air as if they were hit by a car. Their hearing will also elevate to the point that they can hear even the faintest swimming of a goldfish in the murmur and breaths of survivors far away and in other rooms across a building. Although they will be debilitated by this very acute sense of sound because any volumes of 24 hertz or higher can put them in immense amounts of pain with even the sound of rain debilitating them as if large amounts of static are being injected into their brain. Their sense of smell will also be jacked Backed up to 11, being able to smell the flesh of living beings like a shark attracted by blood in the ocean. They retain all knowledge of their prior life and the motor skills associated with it, allowing them to use weapons, open doors, climb surfaces, and more, a lot of which normal zombies could never achieve. But besides things normal humans can do, but as a self-healing bioweapon, they can even use hordes of the undead to their advantage by attracting their attention to hone in on a designated target or even using their own infected bodily fluids to forcefully infect you or others to create more zombies or hambies to potentially work with them or just to kill you off because all it takes is one bite and then they don't have to fight. Some hambies wouldn't immediately resort to violence and seek peace in some ways as they come to terms with what they are now. But because of their different nature, odor, demeanor, and cravings, many a man would fear their existence and either seek to kill these abominations or segregate, persecute, torture, and contain them, forcing many of these hambies to rebel and fight back to survive, get revenge at humanity, or possibly deeming themselves as superior life forms in their own heaven that will infect others to turn them into mindless drones for hambies to somewhat command or just push around because they're just mindless shells now. 
This new species of calculating and intelligent undead will be nearly indistinguishable from other humans, save for a few wounds, a lowered temperature, and the body odor that makes you smell like a rotting corpse. They can use this visage to infiltrate areas and claim to be purely human and act all innocent, even if they commit crimes against nature, like devouring the flesh of a dead body or something. But if going unnoticed, they could effectively raid safe havens or infiltrate compounds biting unsuspecting people or infecting them in efficient ways like blood-soaked arrows and knives or even using their blood to pollute drinking water and food and medical supplies. That's something that really should have been discussed or used further. Imagine drinking water having their blood in it. And why do I bring that up too? Because testing water, testing the bodies, testing their blood, medical testing in general will be inconsistent as they will test both positive and negative. Testing for this disease will never be 100%, randomly allowing them to pass viral examination to be allowed entry into wherever they want to go. It is a 50-50 shot if it's going to pop up. Now, if these hambies are found out, it would take tons of gunfire and trauma to the body to take them down, but in most cases, they would be able to spread their infection and influence rather quickly. This will be the case for a large majority of hambies, as the overwhelming sense to kill others will remain prevalent in their minds, wishing to kill those that stand in their way no matter how. Some, as stated before, will work in conjunction with living people as they are still half human and will help them, like going out to get them food, slip through hordes because the hordes won't do anything, and fight other hambies without risking infection and, more importantly, death. But this would rely on a stable mindset for the hamby after turning and resisting the hellish urge of cannibalism all the while. Your only real chance of fighting them head-on is by having a hamby of your own or being a hamby that can fight on equal footing or if you have enough weaponry to really take them out. But more often than not, those that mutate will most likely end up becoming hostile to others and brutalizing them. So, keeping this all in mind, what does this mean for you? The scenario is the Jonas virus suddenly cropping up and spreading like wildfire in your area. In the midst of the outbreak, chaos would be exponentially catastrophic within the first few hours, as the ensuing frenzy would have people not knowing the true danger this virus poses. It's possible that it maybe didn't even start with the first zombie. Maybe a dead rat got into a water supply, it got into our drinkable water, or maybe it got into a crowd of people and they spread the disease. This disease has the capability to spread way more than we let on. But once it has spread, if you haven't drank the tainted water, if you haven't been bitten, family and friends not coming to immediate terms with seeing their loved ones infected willingly or unwillingly will draw close enough to be attacked and infected and or killed. The ferocity of each infected once they are fully turned and how quick most would turn would efficiently wipe out a good chunk of the population fast, especially considering the fact that even if you are armed, most people know to aim for the head of a zombie. But remember here, some zombies can even survive being completely impaled through the skull or shot in the head. So, armed and unarmed people alike would fall quickly to this destructive, angry, bloody beasts. There is a lot that we're going against and a lot of inconsistencies of this disease that really kind of turn everything on its head. The bottom line is a lot of people are going to be getting infected. Emergency services would be fragmented and nigh useless as they struggle to to help the first pockets of people calling for help. But communications would not be shut down by governmental services in the first few days to prevent fake news like the show dictates. But eventually, electricity, comm towers, and more would eventually go down, effectively making everyone go dark and resort to their immediate areas and those around them. Some of us may be evacuated to safe zones, but what happens to you within these zones can be highly up in the air as government and military officials try to pin down what this virus is and what it is capable of, meaning potential infection could be executed on the spot, or possibly even all those in a pandemic outbreak radius being killed and having their bodies burned to quell the growth. It is also possible many refugees will be migrated and all confined to small spaces in quarantine with tons of other people in poor living conditions while desperate measures at a vaccine are made. Which, again, as stated by Dr. Lee, is impossible. And the only real method of any kind of a cure is killing 
any and all potential hosts of the disease and cremating their corpses, possibly leading towards massive genocide via armed soldiers as you sit there defenselessly with nowhere else to run. Well, you can try to break out of this quarantine before or during the culling, but you'll most likely be gunned down too. If a mass execution by a government order is not enacted, long-term life in the camp could wear morale for people down, leading to massive riots occurring, having other panic survivors possibly killing you, or you being caught in the crossfire of civilians versus soldiers. Or, one of these people in the camp could also be a carrier or a half-bee that could use these safe zones as perfect starting points to spread another outbreak. Eventually, or irregardless, we will all be thrust into the apocalypse to fend for ourselves without awaiting rescue if we aren't already dead or turned at this point. Your greatest asset once out there will be trusting others to have your back and not to shove you into harm's way to save themselves. Or you could be that very person sacrificing others to save your own ass. But keep in mind that doing so would not only have others quick to do the same to you in return, but also you'll eventually run out of human shields to throw at the horde and be all by yourself. Bottom line is with the greater number of these kinds of zombies, the more you'll need to band together with others to make it. Trusting others and fortifying yourself with them is your best bet for your chances of survival. But trusting people could also burn you, since people in a lawless landscape will be unpredictable as their true natures will shine through in the darkness. More so, Hambies could be working as sleeper agents waiting to sink their teeth into you at any moment if the craving strikes or they wish to have another zombie in their midst. However, it would also come down to your sheer willpower to not only persevere in daunting situations of survival and horror, but to know when mortality must be taken away. If you or someone else is bitten, you must come to terms with the fact that you or them must die soon as to not risk the lives of anyone else. Do you have what it takes not to cover up a bite wound for fear of your own end? Do you have what it takes to kill someone you love or someone you've come to trust in a moment's notice? Would you be able to kill yourself as to not turn and have your repurposed body infect others? Would you or your loved ones even have time to come to terms with these facts? Or would you be so riddled with fear that the virus is able to take hold of your consciousness and turn you before you can even reason in either fashion? Can you retain your fears and insecurities long enough to do anything about it? Can you trust others not to be hambies that can switch alliances at any moment due to their own cravings? Do you believe yourself to be genetically and mentally unique enough to become a Hamby and live through the turning process and gamble those odds with the people around you? And no, when it comes to the outbreak and its beginnings, you will not have a how to beat video to tell you how to beat them. You know, when it comes to how to beat stuff and people say they can survive all the time, see of it like this. Yeah, the kid from Home Alone could stand a chance against Predator if given enough preparation and setup time. But with these scenarios, there is no prep. There is no watching in-depth videos on what to do about a specific situation a few days before it happens. It's not like you're cramming for a test you won't retain the knowledge of and you still got a 71 on it. This, my friend, is happening to you while you're at work, at school, in bed, on your computer, or just shitting on the toilet. Now flush. As it is for many other people, unless you specifically work out, train in hand-to-hand -hand combat, are physically fit with proper equipment, can make critically quick decisions in chaotic scenarios with a cool and calm manner, well, you're not going to be fending off hordes of zombies and getting to safety in the first few days unless you're just hella lucky in the right place at the right time or are pretty much a doomsday prepper with tons of supplies, weapons, sturdy structures, and reliable people. Again, probably not you. Of course, grabbing whatever you can to fight back against a zombie with whatever objects, weapons, and supplies you have at your immediate disposal is going to be a given. From knives to bats to fashioning sharp objects out of brooms and mop handles and even using fire hoses to suppress hordes down. Look around you right now. Is there anything you could do to stop a zombie that can only be killed by destroying the brain? Well, technically. But would you be able to if a zombie were to bust through the door right now? And then we also have to discuss firearms. Guns, depending on what country you're in, will either be a legendary drop or a common item. Either way, they will need to be utilized. You're going to need a weapon 
win because you're not taking down a zombie in a 1v1 fist fight where any bite or potentially scratch could infect you. It's not advisable even with proper protection. So suiting yourself up with duct tape on all major limbs, joints in your neck, or maybe sports gear and thick clothing are the most advisable advice you can take to prevent the deadliest outcome of being bitten. Utilizing all of a regular zombie's shortcomings like their lack of intelligence, oversensitive hearing, and tunnel vision will be crucial, making barricades to slow them down or even stop them in their tracks, as most can't learn how to climb over obstacles, making loud noises in far off areas to keep them far away and distracted, luring them into pitfalls where they will fall into open holes and become trapped, and again, waiting for rain or other large sources of sound to easily sneak past or even periodically execute them over time. While they're distracted by rain, you can come up and stab them in the back of the head. But remember, unlike the show for getting a Another key concept of its own virus, you're going to need to avoid getting any blood near any open orifice of yours as a bloodied rag did in fact turn someone even though it was on the rag for like 10 or 15 minutes. So it's safe to say any drop of blood or bodily fluids or saliva that enters your eye, an open wound, or your mouth could have you switching teams in moments. So add on extra eye, mouth, and generally just full body protection head to toe. You will have to slaughter zombies and blood will be flying. You are gonna have to come to terms with that if you do not have the cojones to be able to slaughter someone or, you know, just deal with that, you're not gonna make it in this apocalypse. Now, say the outbreak is kept within a widely contained area like a city, and you find yourself either escaping or being evacuated. Healthy and fearful people outside quarantine would want you to go back to where you came from or kill you, not wanting to risk you being a carrier that could possibly spread the infection further, risk you being a carrier or even a hamby if they know what that is that could possibly spread the infection further. Some would deem those afflicted by the disease as possessed by the devil. Ooh. And this whole predicament as punishment from God. Ah. Oh. Militarized efforts may even have to resort to executing anyone within infected areas as targets to open fire on to ensure the disease stays contained while it is fully figured out. But our scenario, once again, is if it's somehow spread worldwide, possibly through water supplies or something more reminiscent of the bubonic plague that spread through rodents, insects, and dead bodies throughout Eurasia in the 1300s, killing millions, which, if rats and animals of that nature are contracting the virus and getting everywhere uncontrollably, it's very possible it could spread in a similar fashion, especially in apocalyptic scenarios where you can't really keep sanitation in a really good degree. You'll have to be and defenses that can withstand full bodies flinging themselves at your doors, walls, and windows constantly, while also making sure creatures of all sizes can't weasel their way in easily. These zombies are remarkably resistant to most forms of damage and can regenerate health in a matter of time, often forcing you into situations where dehydration, hunger, and exhaustion will surely take hold. As these regular zombies make a generic zombie apocalypse on steroid happen, remember, we had a mouse that was infected, so it's possible any mammal could be infected as well. So this could up the danger factor if they can infect many different types of mammals like dogs, rodents, cats, and if you think about it, if they reach a zoo and whatnot, we could see two gorillas, elephants, and more, all craving living flesh and hunting down the living while using their varying sizes and stature to either sneak into places or just purely break down walls with enhanced strength and enhanced hearing and smell. This could lead to an army that can tackle any situation, become the ultimate predators, stronger, more bloodless to your, smarter, and their senses getting a lot higher with attained regenerative properties. There's a lot going on. Imagine it. Hamby Harambe. With that said though, animals, despite me stating that they could become hambies, isn't likely, as I would assume that hambification of the Jonas virus can only mutate within Homo sapiens, so realistically, the greatest threat of all will be of course the human hambies. They will begin to crop up in pockets across the world as a large majority of them will most likely give in to their urges and fear, and will use their many biological tools at their disposal to attack others and satiate their voracious hunger. 
their enhanced senses of smell and hearing will lend to them finding, hiding individuals or small groups of survivors to convert them or just make them into a giant smorgasbord while gathering numbers to go for hideouts of survivors and safe havens and coordinate attacks with other hambies that will make your attempt to survive futile against their hardened corpse bodies. Normally, fighting regular zombies of this ferocity is enough to end you, or at least exhaust you until the numbers overwhelm you, but regular humans with heightened strength and senses that can use weapons, vehicles, and tools, and having ways to destroy or ascend places is a game changer. They can intentionally infect you from far away. There's a lot they are capable of doing to put you down for good. Using their knowledge, powers, ways of infection, and more to break down and through all defenses for a slow but periodic death and evolution, if you want to view it that way, of all mankind. If we have a smart Hamby, one that's like Dr. Lee, if he could strategize the end of humanity, well, that is very possible. You'll need a plan to get out of wherever you are bunkered down in order to find safety, food, and water eventually. But if you're able to, you know, survive on your own, you're still going to need a plan to get out of wherever you are bunkered down in order to find safety, food, and water eventually and maintain that for long periods of time. You'll most likely have to leave towns or cities to avoid the larger bulk of the zombie population and survive off the land and deal with the harsh reality of survival and relying on instincts of food gathering, shelter creating, and Which, more. And A no. lot of us are pretty boned in our comfortably living lives. Going out when rain starts pouring down will be your only real avenue of scavenging for supplies, as downpours mask the sense of warm bodies and mask about every sound made, causing zombies of every type to enter a distracted state. If it isn't raining, good luck not being heard by a zombie just by making the slightest noise or smell. If you're lucky enough to find a safe spot that can go undetected and unfound by the army of the dead, you could possibly wait out the days, surviving and hoping military or armed rescue will happen by. Bye. You'll also have to watch out for rodents that may infest your compound, as seemingly any mammal could be infected and ready to bite you while you are casually going about or sleeping. But even more dreadfully so than watching wherever you go is the worst possible outcome living above. When you have militaries looking to wipe out nests of zombies that there's no real cure for except death, it's very possible and probable that widespread napalm, nukes, or tactical explosive strikes will be used. Since zombies of this type are so attracted to noise, militaries would use flocks of drones to emit sound waves in specific hotbed locations to gather the largest number of undead possible in a condensed location in order to most effectively destroy the viral outbreaks at the heart eradicating nearly all infected bodies and cleaning the virus off the face of the earth the best they can. And if you have camped out in this location and you are wondering why the fuck it got so loud suddenly, they're going to give you fair warning about the upcoming attack via a helicopter announcement. But good luck not getting bit or eaten alive as you panic to get out of wherever you've been hiding. If you cannot do that, you're going to be wiped out in nuclear hellfire. With those that do survive all of this, you're still going to have to be hunted by the army to either kill you or keep you in indefinite containment. If not for armed intervention, the infection will eventually reach you as the infected numbers tally up more and more and the hambies begin to rise, indoctrinating people. And the more intelligent people and stronger people that go in their ranks, the more chance that they will create an army that cannot be defeated. Making any notion of fighting back and surviving the best you can pale in comparison to their numbers and insane abilities. The only realistic way I see you surviving all of this is if you turn into a half bee yourself. And that all relies on your mental state, antibodies, and genetics. You gotta hit the genetic lottery because only four characters and a few unnamed people at the end are revealed to mutate into this new species. So your chances are quite low. But even if you do become a Hamby and decide to live your life with other Hambies in secrecy and solitude, military organizations would eventually figure this out and try to hunt you down to wipe out the disease permanently or seek to harvesting your flesh to have this virus in order to experiment on it to create either new forms of biological warfare or to create super soldiers to dominate battlefields. 
If the direct cause of what makes a Hamby is pinpointed and those that wish to abuse its power are given full advantage, there's no telling what could happen in the long run for humanity. Much like the FEV virus from Fallout, forcing the virus on others to see it evolve humanity, no matter the cost. So, with all that being said, in the end, will you die to other survivors who are panicking or just trying to survive on their own? Will you become infected and wander the earth as an empty shell of a zombie? Will you be executed by security forces who desperately try to contain the virus via lead, fire, or explosives? Or will you get lucky and evolve as a Hamby and let fear, anger, and a voracious appetite dictate your new state of existence as you are a powerful new being that will be actively hunted for the remainder of your life? Can you avoid all of this, every animal, every person, potentially turning within seconds? Do you have the mental fortitude? Can you make it? Can you survive? <laughs> 세포 하나하나가 살기 위해 몸부림치며 몸이 분노로 바뀌면 누구보다 강해질 거라고 생각했다 이럴 거면 차라리 싸워 죽기 살기로 각오하고 덤비기라도 하라고 이건 폭력의 시스템이다 나처럼 아무것도 아닌 사람 시스템 못 바꾸냐。彼らの存在を彼らの存在を彼らの存在を彼らの存在を彼らの存在を彼らの存在を彼らの存在を彼らの存在を彼らの存在を彼らの存在を彼らの存在を彼らの存在を彼らの存在を彼らの存在を